and welcome to the Passenger Seat Podcast, a podcast designed to fill your passenger seat with chat about classic cars, all recorded from my 1968 Morris Minor Peggy. I'm Becca, and today I'm on my way to work, back on the daily commute, even in the horrendous winds and rains and things that we've been having uh, lately. But today I'm going to tell you about a woman who did some much more impressive and uh, high-stakes driving than myself, and that is Kay Petra. So earlier this week I was actually uh, having a chat with my parents and the chairman of the Singer Owners Club about one of my favourite historic uh, circuits, probably my favourite historic circuit, uh, which is Brooklands. And we were talking about some of the fantastic women that raced there um, back when it was um, a high profile circuit. And um, obviously we all know that uh, one of my favourite historic women drivers is Betty Haig. Uh, and I've done a podcast on her. Uh, but talking about uh, Kay Petra, I realised that there wasn't an awful lot that I knew about her, and I thought it would be good to do a little bit of research and um, then share that with you guys as well. So Kay was born in Toronto over in Canada. She came over to England to do uh, schooling. Then she went and did uh, art in Paris as a degree and then uh, ended up going back to Canada where she had quite a prolific uh, ice skating career uh, during which she was married to her first husband. However, her first husband unfortunately passed away and it was during her time ice skating and things like that over there that she met who would become her second husband, Henry Petra. Uh, Henry was over from England, he lived in Essex on business in Toronto and uh, despite his kind of uh, <laughs> nickname as uh, Peter the Monk, he brought Kay back, married her at uh, Brooklyn's Flying Club and uh, their marriage was to be one that was going to be hugely influential on Kay um, and see out the rest of their lives. And the reason it was so influential on Kay was that Henry uh, allowed her to drive and race in his car initially and then also bought her her first car uh, to compete in herself, a Wolseley Hornet uh, Daytona Special. Even over in Canada, uh, Kay had had quite an interest in cars for racing and knew that kind of coming over to England would allow her to take part in a lot of the sport that she had uh, grown an interest in. And having a husband that was so heavily involved with Brooklyn's Flying Club certainly helped that as well. really did go from strength to strength. She is, as I suggested, very heavily uh, kind of associated with Brooklands because that is where she had some of her most infamous successes. And to succeed as well as she did on what is considered quite a prestigious but also challenging circuit, even in period, uh, regardless of gender, was in very, very highly regarded, but also um, to be one of only two women that received the 130 miles per hour uh, Brooklyn's Racing Club uh, badge, uh, and there only being 17 people in total that have ever received it, um, was a, a real feat and, and really cemented her for her lap that she did in the Deliage. Some of her big successes at Brooklands was setting a new women's speed lap record at the course, setting some overall lap records uh, at the course as well, sometime a little bit later in her career. 
and driving a four litre Invicta that had belonged to Henry to uh, set some further records at the site. recognisable whilst at Brooklands for her uh, well-maintained uh, look and her light blue overalls. She also started to paint many of her cars to match her light blue overalls so that she had kind of quite a distinctive look on the circuit and off. She was also known for uh, fitting little compartments behind the seats in her um, cars to be able to fit a uh, lipstick, a stopwatch, um, some hairpins, uh, a few other little bits and pieces that would kind of get lost in a car otherwise, especially when they didn't necessarily have uh, such handy and useful glove boxes as we have now, so that she would be able to tidy herself up after a race uh, and uh, kind of be able to get nice photos and things, I guess, after um, breaking one of the records or doing such a successful race. So a really iconic look and behaviour I think trackside from Kay. Another thing that really stood out about Kay was her quite small stature. She was four foot ten and one of the most infamous photos I think I've seen of her is her stood next to an absolutely huge deliage. She was really well known for driving big cars like Bugattis and Bentleys and the Deliage and the Invicta um, and to be able to do that they often had to make adaptations so the Deliage that in 1935 she set um, another record at Brooklands Inn going 134.75 uh, miles per hour around the lap around the course um, they had to fit wooden blocks strapped to the pedals and adjust the seat heighting for her to be able to operate the car um, and then to be able to operate it at such speeds um, with such confidence is really outstanding uh, in terms of just kind of not being phased by these adaptations that have had to be made and just think how well she could have done in the car if it had been originally designed for someone of her height. She also competed in some 1930s Grand Prix, the first one being the 1934 Australian Grand Prix and again she was the first woman to do such a thing and it makes me really think about how we've almost gone backwards. Uh, we had Kay in the 1930s going out and competing uh, side by side with men in uh, Grand Prix races when racing was kind of a completely different ball game and so kind of intensive on uh, the body and on the kind of mind and the control of these uh, relatively primitive vehicles compared to some stuff that we have now uh, and to kind of compete on that stage as a woman and it not be kind of well, it was a big thing, but it, it not be impossible for her to do it makes like it in outstanding that we are now further back almost than we were then in terms of that sort of equality. And whilst she didn't um, get very well placed in that race because of mechanical failures, it was fascinating to kind of think about that aspect of uh, how we've perhaps gone backwards in our uh, equality in motorsport. Much like uh, my favourite Betty Haig, uh, we have uh, a little bit of a connection through uh, singers. Uh, obviously, this is partially why the, the conversation came up with Arthur. Um, because she, in 1934, raced in an all-women's team in the light car club relay at Brooklands, and it was all singers. Uh, they were in red, white, and blue. Kay, obviously, driving the blue one uh, with kind of sequential registrations. And uh, 
whilst they whilst it was kind of delayed by a year and was actually supposed to happen a year earlier um, and the cars were, were not ready they managed to do an outstanding job winning the Houghton Cup which was kind of the best place ladies team and also coming fifth overall in that light relay and this wasn't kind of a publicity stunt or anything really by Singer as a motor factor as oh we're going to have an all women team that um, are going to compete in this because all three women that competed in the team and Kay perhaps more so than than anyone were exceptional drivers themselves who had earned a place on a, a team that was going to do well and to see her excelling in cars that were much smaller engine sized and perhaps more affordable at the time than your Bugattis and your Bentleys and your Deliages and your Invictors um, really shows the range and ability of her skill. Unfortunately, her racing career was cut somewhat short by uh, a tragic accident that happened at Brooklands in 1937. By this time, she's been taken on by Austin to test out their cars, and whilst testing car number five on the track, uh, a car that was further up the track, driven by Reg Parnell, uh, loses kind of the speed because of the embankment and uh, then starts to come down and crashes into the rear end of uh, Kay's car while she was traveling at around 90 miles per hour. By some miracle, she is severely injured and unconscious but alive, which in this period for crashes of that kind of nature is something really to be um, amazed at. But it does really end her racing career and she no longer goes on to race. She moves into uh, journalism, initially kind of food journalism, um, but then becomes the first woman to join the Guild of Motoring Writers and uh, is able to continue to drive round to many of the races that she had peers taking part in and uh, cover them for a variety of magazines. Unfortunately, tragedy strikes again with one of these instances where she is covering uh, the Monte Carlo uh, and following it in uh, a car. And this takes place in 1939 and the car that she is driving is hit by a lorry. And while she is uninjured, the journalist that she's with uh, Reggie Epsom was killed instantly and it does lead to um, some legal proceedings by uh, his widow uh, post-war because obviously some things meant to uh, mean obviously some things with that all get delayed by the break in the outbreak of World War II but she does continue to have a hand in on a lot of um, aspects of motor and she doesn't leave motor sport entirely for some time she's involved with kind of team managers and obviously the journalism um, and in the 1950s post-war she's approached by Austin this time to consult them on colorways uh, in particular for the A50 and A60 Austin Cambridges and um, that's why we see so many kind of light blues and things in their color range in this period and then even in the 1970s, she's approached by BMC again to help uh, design the interiors of uh, minis and make them uh, more appealing to uh, a women audience. Which I guess harks back to carrying lipstick, bobby pins and some cigarettes and things in a little compartment that she fitted behind her seats back in the 1930s. Unfortunately, her husband, who had been so supportive and um, on board and part of inspiring uh, Kay's hugely successful motoring career, 
passes away in 1962 uh, and she continues to live alone in the apartment that they shared in St John's Wood in London until 1994 when she dies at the age of 91. So that's kind of a brief summary of some of the amazing feats of Kay Petra and I think it's just all, every time I read about uh, some of these amazing women that were taking on huge 4.2 or 4.3.7 uh, litre cars and racing them at massive speeds around such challenging courses such as Brooklands uh, it, it really gives you a, a great sense of pride in terms of uh, how brave and pioneering uh, some of those women were in getting behind the wheels of these cars that were massive, not built for them um, and absolutely excelling at what they do. And whilst it's lovely that we've got so many stories like that of Kay Petra and Betty Haig, uh, I think it's more important that we start to see more of this equality uh, spilling back into motorsport uh, nowadays. But I hope you've enjoyed hearing about Kay Petra if you hadn't already or perhaps having a little bit of a refresher about what an amazing woman she was. Uh, um, thank you ever so much for listening. Drive safely and happy motoring.